and word pictures, principles 11 and 12, God, what you're seeing in the relationship between Hosea and his wife, Gomer, is a picture of God, the Father, and Israel. That relationship, that husband and wife relationship. And if you study, and as we've been looking at the book of Hosea, she pictures Israel and she keeps falling away. She keeps doing her adulterous things. And if you remember when we were in Israel, right, Sylvia? Who was in Israel with us last time we were there? Uh, Leroy Doris. Uh, yeah, all you guys that were there. Remember when we were in Caesarea Philippi? When we were sitting down and the big cave was there and all the Nichos, that was the heart of the pagan worship that was going on in northern Israel. So you see God connecting dots for us. So when Jesus brings and gathers his disciples to provide them a significant truth, guess where he sits them down? In the very vortex, in the very heart of pagan worship, which was Caesarea Philippi. And he sits them down and he's, and he's revealing some profound stuff to them. So there's your context. There's a reason why Jesus did what he did. Specific places that he went, where he taught the disciples, how he taught the disciples. Because he was revealing truth and, and providing perspective to what it is and why it is that Israel did what they did. Which is straying from this relationship, this husband-wife relationship that Israel was a part of in the Old Testament. So Jesus sits them down and he says two things to them. And he asks the question, all right, who do men say that I am? And then, who, and then he asks Peter, who do you say that I am? And that's where you hear that really cool response. Well, you're the Messiah. You are the king. This is where that truth comes out, right? Why did Jesus ask that? Because the people, the children of Israel that were living in that place historically in the Old Testament were worshiping idols had built two golden calves, were built their own temple mount, and there's, they had their own places of worship where they were worshiping the idols and the, the gods of Baal and of the Assyrians and doing all the crazy stuff that you see going on in America today. We'll touch on some of that next week when we get to chapter four. But it's awesome to see how all these dots connect. So when Jesus says, all right, who do men say I am? He's, he asked that question in a specific place for a specific reason. And then Peter comes up with this response and he goes, you nailed it, dude. And because of your, because of your, you knowing this truth, he says, this is going to be how I'm going to begin my church. And then he goes on, he says something next, which is really profound in the gates of what? <clears throat> and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what else is in Caesarea Philippi? This huge cave that the Greeks believed was the entrance into hell, into Hades. So again, Jesus revealing some really profound and significant things to these guys relative to stuff. So again, you can see and you can go back to first and second Kings and, and you're going to find these places in the old Testament that, uh, um, Israel began to follow through and, and use to, um, to do that. So, these charts are also there are very important. And then there's this other chart that Larry provided, which is also very good. That looks like this. <coughs> Everybody have that one handy real quick. Because <coughs> I don't have these on the screen. But again, you've got the prophet's name on the left. And if you notice, the uh, first prophet on the list is Obadiah. The reason why Obadiah shows up first and not Hosea like we see on our bookmarks, right? Is because this is a chronological list. These are in the order that they showed up historically, okay? So this gives you the dates that they preached, that they taught, uh, what nation or who they were specifically preaching to. In this case, for example, we're going to get to Obadiah in a few months. He's one of the prophets that is preaching not to the nor northern tribes, the 10 northern tribes or even the two southern tribes, but to the Edomites. So there are some groups of people that God calls out, Gentile groups, that are going to play a significant role in prophecy in the future. We'll talk when we get there who the Edomites are and where Edom is on the map. So all, all this is really important and significant. And then you'll see um, off to the right, uh, <coughs> just, uh, I mean, what kings were in control or in power. Again, just some different perspectives or some different views of um, 
the history and where these prophets show up. Um, and then the third chart, and uh, we did this today for you, and it looks like this. Um, the one on the screen doesn't look exactly like this because I went ahead and added a few things to this to kind of give you one quick glance real quick. Uh, you see all the prophets on the upper part. This is the main part of the, the chart. And these are the dates that they show up again. These are in chronological order. The guy Obadiah shows up and the first three prophets that show up historically are not preaching to either the southern or northern tribes. They're preaching to these Gentile groups. The Edomites in Obadiah's case, Nineveh, the book of Jonah, right? Nineveh, he goes all the way to Nineveh, which is modern day Iraq or Mosul, Iraq. And uh, Nahum is another guy that preaches to the Ninevites. We'll talk about Nineveh and who the Assyrians are when we get there in a few weeks. We're in actually the book of Hosea, probably in a couple of weeks. Because the Ninevites or the Assyrians show up during Hosea's time. So if you look at the next two, Amos and Hosea, and we drew a distinction between Israel and Judah. Whenever you're reading in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, and you're seeing the name Israel, it's always a reference, principle one of Bible study, context, it's always a reference to the 10 northern tribes, okay? And then you'll, you'll see in these other prophets that show up like Joel, Isaiah, Micah, when you'll see they'll be referencing or referring to Judah, it's always the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. So these guys show up later. And uh, after, after the book of uh, Hosea, we'll be looking at the book of Joel. That's a really crazy, crazy, crazy prophetic book that we'll be considering because there's a lot said about the second coming of Christ in the book of Job that you're going to find really fascinating. <clears throat> so all these guys show up in the book of Judah. Last week, the question was, was asked, what does it mean? What does pre-exilic, exilic, post-exilic post mean? There's nothing complicated about that term. And I, I apologize for not making it clear three weeks ago. But what you need to consider when you look at this chart is when Israel went in complete apostasy, um, and the Gentile kingdoms came in and controlled them. The Assyrians up in the north and then later the Babylonians in the south. They were taken and they were led captive. So that, exil that term exilic simply means exile. So when they were taken exile, that's when these prophets show up. So all these guys in the second column where it says pre-exilic, and I'm referring to that as the chaotic kingdom stage this is where it was really chaos man it was just bizarre it's crazy stuff going on in the history of israel um all that is before the exile so these guys are showing up these prophets both major and minor if you look at your chart the major prophets are in capital letters ezekiel daniel isaiah jeremiah and then the minor prophets in the small letters so Ezekiel and Daniel, they show up when Israel is in captivity. In 606 BC, the Babylonians come in and the last two tribes are taken captive. They're let, they are taken captive into Babylon. And that's where these guys show up. David? Well, when, <coughs> they, when they, Daniel was in like Judah, right? So that's when Judah yes. was taken into exile. Great point. Great. I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. Exactly. Yes. David brings up a good point, and you're going to see this when you're reading in 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, is there's two different Gentile groups that come in to control Israel during this bizarre time in their history as to why the prophet showed up. These guys show up to warn God's people about impending judgment and doom if they don't get their act together. And man, talk about a talk about a uh, a model for what's going on in america today anyway so these these guys that are preaching like amos and hosea and then the other three are preaching to the ninevites the ninevites are the assyrians they come in in 721 bc some 120 years before the babylonians and take they take they take the they don't, they don't take the northern tribes um captive what they did was they assimilated. 
So they came in and they controlled the 10 northern tribes. This is when they started bringing all the idol worship in and all the Baal worship that was coming in from Assyria or from Nineveh. And so they start imposing their religion and their values on God's people. And now they've really gone awry. Now they're worshiping Baal and they're worshiping the God of the Assyrians. And you know what they're also doing? Now they're intermarrying and they're taking Jewish women as brides. Hence, a new people group is, is born from that relationship. And they're known in the Bible as the Samaritans. So when you see... Uh, when you see the disciples and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the Pharisees and the scribes, the guys that were in Jerusalem in Jesus' time, they were very critical of the disciples because they would walk and they would go through Samaria. The Samaritans, they, they, the Jews looked down at them. They looked, down, looked down their nose at them because they were, quote, half-breeds. They were half-Jew and half-Gentile. They were half-Jewish and half-Assyrian. Um, half so the Samaritans were really looked down. And here's what's really interesting. The Samaritan people still exist in the Middle East today. There's a huge community. And I think I mentioned it last week in, um, in uh, the heart of Israel, a, a Palestinian city called Nablus and up on the, um, the mountain there. What's the, what's the name of the mountain that we were on? Uh, uh, Gerson. Who said that? Good job. Mount Gerson. Leroy, good job. Was that you? So I don't remember that little village when we left, when we were all gathered together, that's a Samaritan village. And there's another huge community in, um, in Tel Aviv and a bunch of them in California. So they're still there. They're still present. They have their own script. They have their own language, their own culture, a really unique group of people. So when Jesus meets with his disciples one last time in the book of Acts before he ascends, Right. And the disciples are asking him, okay, when are you going to restore is the kingdom to Israel? Because God's plan has always to put a kingdom on earth under the throne of David. They're asking, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. Don't worry. You know what I want you to do? Remember this, verse 9? I want you to be witnesses where for me in Jerusalem, you're going to preach to the Jews. Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, the southern part of Israel, Samaria, where the Samaritans were from, and then the uttermost. You know who the uttermost is? Us. You guys, us. So Jesus' plan was always to reach the world. And you know how he ends up doing it? How does he reach the world? By us testifying, by us sharing the gospel. Sylvia just shared something really cool with me. She just led a friend of hers to Christ a few days ago. You know what? That lady now, this Gentile woman that she led to Christ, Hispanic Gentile woman, probably, right? Now she's part of what? The church. Now the church is born. And, and you see it in the early part of the book of Acts. And, and, and you just see God just transitioning and bringing forth his plan. So now Israel, because of their falling away and then killing the prophets and doing what they did to the prophets, they end up in captivity, not in captivity, but they end up dispersed. See the dispersion thing? The Jews are scattered to the four winds, man, for 2,000 years. And for those 2,000 years, guess what God is doing? He's, he's birthing the church. <clears throat> You're going to see an interesting verse tonight in a very unique place in the New Testament called Romans chapter 10. Where, where Paul says something really profound as he's writing specifically about the Jewish people in that, con in, in that context. But it's about the church because that was God's plan. So the church holds a unique place and a very unique purpose in God's ultimate plan. Remember the promise? Remember the whole promise thing that we've been talking about here? Who did he make that promise literally to? To Israel. See the green line? That's Israel's promise. What was the promise? What was the promise that God made to the Jews? Specifically. Two things. Land. And a great nation. And a great people. That God was going to use to establish a kingdom on this earth. And through that kingdom, they were going to bless the world. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. So, I'm going to bless you, Abraham, so that you could be a blessing. And that was God's plan from the very beginning. And that promise 
went awry and it fell apart. Why? Because God's people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons, where do they end up? In Egypt. On their own. Embracing the religions of the Egyptians, right? They, they end up in bondage, don't get me wrong. And then God has to do, raise up a man by the name of Moses to free his people from Egyptian bondage. And then you see it in the book of Acts. I'm sorry, in the book of Acts. In the book of Exodus. And this is where the law shows up. So this is where you see, uh, this is where you see the Ten Commandments show up. And then later on, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. I shared with you something really important last week. Don't ever forget this. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter number 28, God said, if you don't stay true to these promises, to what I've done and, and, and how I'm going to use you, and God is communicating this to the nation of Israel as they're getting ready to enter the land. Remember that, David, when we were in, when we were at the Dead Sea and we kept pointing at Mount Nebo. When, when, when Moses is standing on this mount, he's revealing and he's showing the nation of Israel, all the people, the promised land. He's saying to them, there it is. Go, let's take it. And then while he's laying this out, he says, don't forget, if we fail in the promises and all that God has called us to be and all that God has called us to do, you know what's going to happen to us? Deuteronomy 28, we're going to be conquered by, pe by Gentile peoples. We will be led captive. It took some thousand years later, but sure enough, it happened. And it's the same thing that happens to us when we tend to stray from God. Is we find ourselves captive to different thoughts, attitudes, addictions. All these things that happen when we lose sight of our purpose. And this is what the whole Bible story is about, that God has a plan for a people. He's got a purpose for them. And all he desires and all he wants to do is restore and redeem this fallen world, this fallen kingdom that, as we've talked before a number of times, way back here when Lucifer fell. And after this whole timeline is done, now we're at eternity future and his kingdom is eternal. And guess who's going to be a part of that? The church the Jews will also be existing through eternity and the Gentile world, those three groups of people. Different roles, different purposes, but nonetheless, that timeline is nothing more than God going full circle and bringing restoration to a fallen world. I throw this thing up there because you and I can never, ever, ever lose sight of the big picture. You must maintain that or you'll never fully understand the Old Testament, the minor prophets and everything else that we've been talking about. So <clears throat> when we talk about this chart, you see prophets that show up before they were led captive, the, te the 10 northern tribes in 721 BC by the Assyrians, the, uh, the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, um, led captive by the Babylonians. So by the time Ezekiel and Daniel show up here in 606 to 536 BC, because they were in captivity for 70 years exactly, that's when Ezekiel and Daniel show up. These are major prophets. We're not going to be studying these guys or we wouldn't be done till 2024. And then after they're allowed to come back under the, under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, those books in your Bible, then these guys show up. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And I love Haggai because this is a prophet that shows up after they're allowed to return after the Babylon captivity and said, and he's saying, what are we doing, man? Our priorities are still messed up, right? So you see some really practical principles for you and for me in the lives of these minor prophets that we'll be looking at that show up in the post exilic state. That's what we mean by the return stage when they were actually allowed to return back to the land. And that's when they rebuild what we know today as the second temple, right? The temple of Ezra and Nehemiah. All right. So there's kind of the bigger, broader picture that you can't ever lose sight of as we go through these, these books and keep those charts handy. And, 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 and I'm not saying memorize them, but at least know how uh, and where these guys fit so that everything kind of makes sense. Because one of the things that I try to do for you, principle number one of Bible study is always give you some context. Context is key. And 
and knowing and understanding who these guys are, why they show up, where they showed up. So <coughs> when Jesus shows up in the New Testament, right? Right here, 2,000 years ago, um, he's very explicit in telling us that, hey man, the game's changing now. As a matter of fact, he says things like in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he says, think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. Because whenever you're looking at number five, it's actually a reference to the law and the prophets. Those are all, the law and the prophets are always grouped together. Who are the prophets? The dudes on this sheet. He says, I didn't come to destroy them, but to fulfill what they came to do. He says, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. In Matthew eleven thirteen, 13, he says, for, the, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, until John the Baptist. So when John the Baptist shows up, man, the game has changed significantly. You know what that game was? You know what that game is? You know why Jesus came? To set up his kingdom. To set up the kingdom that fell with Solomon in 1000 BC. That divided the kingdom. So everything that he came to do, he came to redeem. That's why we know him as the redeemer. To restore and to bring his people back to him. And doggone it, wouldn't you know it? What did they do? Look at that big red symbol in the middle. They killed him. So when they, when they plastered that crown of thorns on his head, they were mocking him because of what the prophet said who he was to who he was. That he would be the king of the Jews, right? They hung that sign over the cross. Here lies the king of the Jews. That was his plan. That was his intent. And we know from history and we know from the Bible that that door gets shut in the book of Acts chapter 7 after, the, after they kill Stephen once and for all. And now all of a sudden, man, you see God turning his attention to Gentiles. And God says, I don't give a flip if you're Jewish or a Gentile. All you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus and thou shall be what? Saved. Thou shall be saved. Isn't that a cool thing? And you know what he just did? You know what happened in it? By, by professing those words and I pray each and every one of you have done that. Now you're part of this new entity, this new thing called the church. And you know what God did? He restores his kingdom, not physically, but how? Spiritually. See the red? The kingdom of God is always a reference to his spiritual kingdom. The green line is the kingdom of, of heaven or God's literal physical kingdom on this earth. You know, what the whole, you know what the whole second coming is about? And this is what we were touching on last week. This is why you find this guy in the book of Hosea chapter 1 by the name of Jezreel, Hosea's son, and the valley of Jezreel, where the battle of Armageddon is going to happen in the, in the book of Revelation. See how God's going full circle and connecting dots with these dudes? As he reveals and provides this revelation to us, you know what? When Jesus ultimately returns, this red line right here, guess what he's going to do? He's going to restore and he's going to have a literal physical kingdom on planet earth. Jesus is coming back, a literal second coming. And he's not coming to Santa Fe. He's not coming to the United States or New Mexico. He's going to be in Israel. And he's going to set up his throne in Jerusalem, in that temple, for the sole purpose of establishing, establishing the kingdom that fell way back here with Adam and Eve. When God said very explicitly, all right, you're going to have dominion. That concept or that term dominion means kingship, a kingdom. That's the story of the Bible. So that's where these guys show up um <clears throat> real quick here's a again i touched on this last week this is going to be our overview of the book of hosea okay we're going to look at three parts we're still in part one um we should have gotten through part one last week but you guys um distracted me <laughs> so we're going to go through part one and this is what we're calling a prophetic picture because if you again if you look at your principles of bible study um this this book is written by a guy named hosea he's the first of the minor prophets 
not chronologically, but in a very unique and a specific order. Why? What I, we talked about this in our overview. Why does Hosea show up first? <coughs> Why does Hosea show up first? Anybody have any clue? You want a hint? Principle number seven. Never forget your rules of Bible study. Not number seven, five and six. <laughs> Say it again, Sylvia. You know, what, what does his name mean? Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. You know what? You know why this guy shows up first in this, these 12 minor prophets? Because the journey doesn't begin for anybody, including us in the church age, until you're first saved. And the journey, that's where the journey starts. This is why God chose to put this guy first. Again, look where he shows up chronologically. He's way down here. Historically, chronologically. But he shows up first in our list because of the significance. Of his you know the very first thing that God does in these first three chapters that we're going to look at tonight? He paints a very profound picture about how, how, God is married to a very unique woman in history by the name of the nation of Israel. That's what it pictures. A wayward woman by the name of Gomer, that's the type, she's the picture, who continues to come back to him and then turn her back and go a whoring and then she comes back and then she strays and then she comes back and then she strays Sound familiar for a lot of people? That's us. That's a lot of us in life. But you know and you need to know and we're going to see it tonight, man. We serve and we worship a God who is unconditional in his love. He's incredibly powerful in the love that he demonstrates and he shows and never gives up on any of us. That's called mercy. Mercy. That's called significance. That's the, what's so significant. So this marriage to Gomer is a picture of marriage, adultery, and then the restoration of that whole thing. And this is what you see in the first three chapters is this picture. Then next, we're going to look at this prophecy. And this Hosea, man, after allowing his marriage to be a picture of the relationship between God and Israel, now he hangs out for these seven chapters from four to ten, man. He really lets it fly. As a matter of fact, you're going to see how America is following right behind some of the very same things that Israel was struggling with and was dealing with in 700 BC before the Assyrian conquest. <coughs> and then we'll finish up in the last four chapters, 11 through 14, uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, looking back in order to look forward is what I titled it because, again, what you can't lose sight of, although you have these books and these events playing out historically there's always a prophetic significance that god is revealing to us in the lives of these minor prophets okay so that's that's the truck the, that's the structure of the book if you remember last week i made a i made a a comment and just just again by way of of an overview of or a perspective never forget that um and it, it all begins in genesis chapters two and three when the adversary shows up, when Lucifer shows up, God places Adam in the garden and he gives him a very specific uh, purpose. He says, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to replenish the earth. And I'm going to put you in this place called the Garden of Eden. I want you to do two things, Adam. I want you to be a steward of it. In other words, he says, I want you to dress it is the term that he says, the, the, the words that he uses in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15. He says, I want you to dress it. In other words, take care of it. Be a good steward. And then he says something really profound. He says, and I also want you to keep it. In other words, you need to protect this. Now, keep in mind, he's saying this to Adam before, before the serpent ever, ever shows up. Because God knew that he would show up and cause and try to cause dysfunction and brokenness. And that's been a pattern of the um, of the serpent or the adversary ever since the book of Genesis. Here's something to consider. 
The devil desires nothing more than to do three, three things in your life and in my life. Those three things are this. His first, the first thing is to destroy the authority of God's word. If he could get you to doubt or to question God's word, that's where it all begins. The very first words out of his mouth in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 2 is, Yea, hath God said? Question mark. And gets Eve to question or to doubt what God had actually revealed to Adam in Genesis chapter number 2. So he gets him to she she gets him to, to to she gets him or what he does is he destroys the authority of God's word. The second thing he does, he destroys man's purpose. And you know how he destroys man pur man's purpose? By destroying the family. And that's exactly what he set out to do. Hence the title of our Hosea study, a broken heart and home. Because you see the dysfunction going on in Israel, the 10 northern tribes, as it relates to the relationship that you see Hosea and Gomer, his wife, being a picture of. So that's kind of the setting or the stage, if you will. So yeah, uh, sure enough. And I don't, have to, I don't have to say a whole lot about what's going on in our own country, but that's happening Again, and uh, we'll look at some of that stuff next week when we stop to consider how a lot of the, the stuff that is going on even in our own culture, our own country, in our own churches is nothing more than, a, uh, than an echo of what was going on during the days of Hosea. So tonight or last week, we touched on the, uh, the life of a grieving husband because of his grievous wife. You know, in this story, you see... Hosea, just like God the Father, is always faithful, man. He never gives up. He never quits. He's faithful to the marriage. He's faithful to the family. And he's married to this woman by the name of Gomer in the story that is a picture of the nation of Israel and the fact that she's prone to wander. And then tonight, we'll also look at chapter number two. And we'll look at a couple thoughts here. The exposure, God uses chapter two to expose specifically Israel's sin. What was it that was going on in the life of the nation of Israel uh, that caused God to do what he does? And then also in the last part of that chapter, we will see how um, Hosea demonstrates this unconditional divine love for his harlot wife, Gomer. And then we'll close up tonight with chapter three, which is a re the repentance. And it's a very profound picture um, the repentance and restoration of a people. Um, who can tell me from a little bit of studies back in the day and even some things that might have been said last week where you find the um, three chapters in the New Testament that speak of Israel's res restoration? Anybody know? Say it, say it loud, Steve. Romans 9, 10, and 11. Mark those down because in chapter three, you have five little verses in one chapter, but those five verses break down into those three areas, Israel's past, Israel's present and Israel's future. So you get a glimpse of Romans chapters nine, 10, 11 in the third chapter of God's re of Israel's repentance and their restoration um, as being part of God's people. Because again, I don't want you guys. And we talked about it even on Sunday morning. We were talking about the promise that God made with Abraham and Sarah. Um, never forget this chart. We're seeing that restoration happen. See the green line? The restoration is happening right before our eyes with current events. So I'm here to tell you and I'm here to challenge you that let's quit wasting time as a church and know and realize that Israel, the nation of Israel is God's timepiece. If you want to know, if you want to track exactly where God is in his, in his timeline and in his, in his prophetic clock, all we have to do is keep, keep an eye and keep track of, of, um, of what's going on with that people group, that small little nation of 7 million people that affect anything and everything that goes on in this planet, prophetically, historically, even practically. 
Um, anybody watch the debate last night? <laughs> a lot of discussion. A lot of debate about where the capital should be, huh? It's interesting how parties divide on that very issue. Never forget the promise. Genesis chapter 12, Abraham and Sarah last week we talked on Sunday. I'm going to bless nations that bless you and I'm going to curse nations that curse you. So better America better watch out. Um, there's only one foreign policy issue that matters to this country or any country and that's how you treating the Jews. How do you perceive Israel? And I don't think I have to tell you all you have to do is be a little bit aware even on current and new current news, current events. <clears throat> we're seeing anti-Semitism raise its ugly head again like never before. Not like we've seen since World War II. And it's coming hard and it's coming heavy, man. And it's even within the leadership of this country. So just be mindful and be aware. Because there will be hell to pay. <laughs> there will be a consequence to however it is this nation or any, any other nation treats, um, treats how they treat the Jewish people. So... That's just my little soapbox thing um, about who they are and what they're about. If you remember last week, looking at that first point about a grieving husband and a grievous wife, we were looking at chapter number one. Um, I shared with you that in this chapter, <clears throat> you see um, another profound picture show up. Um, you see uh, a son, uh, two sons and a daughter in verses four through nine that show up in the text. Um, that are actually the descendants or actually the sons of uh, the sons and daughter of um, of Hosea and Gomer. Um, again, Gomer is a picture of Israel. Um, Hosea is a picture of Christ or of of God, of, of God, the father. And if you remember, this is what their names mean. The name Jezreel in verse number four, you see the first guy showed up, show up. His name means scattered. In verse 6, the daughter shows up. Her name is Laura, uh, Laura Huma, and her name means no more mercy. And in verse 9, Loami means not my people. So in the very kids that they birthed, God was already portraying a profound picture that I'm going to scatter you without mercy because of your continued falling away. And in that context, you will not be viewed as my people. So what God does is he allows us, just like you and me, free will to make a choice, to scatter, to do whatever it is that we want to do. But there's always consequence to that choice. God gives you a free will. He gives me a free will, just like he did the nation of Israel. But what you're not, what you're not free of or where I'm not free of are the consequences of those choices of the decisions that we make in this life. So they paint a really profound picture, a really important picture for us. If you remember in verse five, um, this verse shows up or this phrase shows up and I, I shall come to pass at that day. Um, those of you that have been here for a while in our How to Study the Bible series and even the book of Revelation, if you go back in your little booklet, there's again, Principle number five, which is measured words. Whenever you see the phrase that day in scripture, it's always a reference to the second coming of Christ. So the context that you're seeing in verse number five, when you see the phrase that day is this event right here. So isn't it interesting that you're seeing a reference to the second coming in verse number five in this historical book about prophetic Israel. Because in the rest of the verse, it says this, look at verse five. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of what? The valley of Jezreel. Remember from last week, where's the valley of Jezreel? Armageddon. Those of you that were with us in Israel, remember when we were standing on the Nazareth Ridge or we were looking east and saw the, saw the runways that are right smack in the Valley of Jezreel? That's the Battle of Armageddon. You know, you know what you see in this account, in this storyline here? A prophetic view of how God's going to bring Jezre in the, within the Valley of Jezreel this scattering of the Jews because it's in Armageddon 
or it's in that valley of, Je of Jezreel where everything is going to play out. And I think I showed you some pictures last week, right? This is what it looks like. So here's where that verse shows up. Here's the valley right here. Here's Nazareth. This is where Jesus grew up. So there's the Sea of Galilee. Here's Nazareth. And there's a little, it sits up high in this little range. And what's really cool, whenever we visit Israel, I always tell Jim Martin, take us to the Nazareth Ridge. And we have a, the privilege of standing right on this ridge, looking all the way across this valley, because this is where the Battle of Armageddon is going to play out. When Napoleon made his way up from Egypt in the 19th century and made his way to Mount Carmel up here, he looked across, he goes, man, what a perfect place for war. More blood has been shed in this valley than anywhere else on the planet. So those of you that are going to Israel in a couple weeks, we'll get on that little ridge so that you could get this view here. These picture, this picture right here is taken from the ridge. This is Mount Tabor, which is this mount right here. This is looking east along the Jezreel Valley. This is that, that, um, that air base that I was talking about. Even Israel has an air base right smack in the middle of it. And this is Megiddo. This is where the term Armageddon comes from. It's a town. It's on the town on the edge of the valley over here. So this is known as the Valley of Jezreel. And right there in Hosea, it's mentioned for you and for me. So a very profound picture. If you remember from last week as well, I shared with you a really interesting fact or an interesting to, truth. Um, after he mentions the, the, the characters, verses 10 and 11 show up. <clears throat> Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured. Um, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them that ye are the sons of the living God. What does that speak to? Verse number 10. That they're going to be restored. That God is going to do exactly what he promised Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12 when we do that study on Sunday mornings. Look at verse 11. Then shall the children of Israel, or I'm sorry, of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered, what? Together. Together. Mind you, at this point in time in history, the kingdom is divided. So you're getting a prophetic view. Show me or remind me or tell me where in history they've been united. They haven't. This is a prophetic account that's going to happen at the second coming of Christ. Then shall the children of Israel and children, uh, children of Judah and Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head and they shall come up out of the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. That second coming of Christ's event is where God literally comes to planet or Jesus does and we're going to see this in Joel. Guess who gets to come with him? We get to come with him at the second coming of Christ at this great battle, at this great event to save the nation of Israel from total annihilation. That's what's going to play out in that valley. That's what's going to happen. Now here's what's really interesting. I made this comment last week. I don't know if you guys caught it. What's really fascinating to me, if I was to pick up a Jewish Bible, if I was to go, go down to the, the Shabbat Center down here and pick up a Jewish Bible. These two verses, verses 10 and 11, aren't in their Bible. But yet they're in our Bible. Which is an interesting fact if you stop and consider the big picture. You know why? They know who they are. It's the Gentile world. Quote, Christian churches as well that refuse to believe that God is going to restore these people. So as a result throughout history, even to this day, there's a movement afoot called replacement theology that's saying the church is replacing Israel in God's plan, in God's purpose. So God sticks these two verses in our Bibles to remind us that no, he's going to restore them and he's got a plan for them. And the same verses that you see here 
are the same verses that you see in the book of Revelation, like verse number 10, where it says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea. You know where else God told a person to look up to the stars because you're, I'm going to number the people as the sand of the sea? Abraham. And it's repeated again in the book of Revelation. Why? Because God ain't done with that green line. And we are, we are absolutely naive. Our head is buried in the sand. Or we're being taught some really false theology and, and false doctrine about what God or God isn't doing with the nation of Israel. I don't have to tell you right now. And you'll see it in the text. You'll see it in Romans 11 here in a minute. But right now, from God's perspective, just like Gomer, this is the significance of the book of Hosea. Just like Gomer, God says, Israel is my enemy. That's how much they've turned their back on God. But he says, but don't be ignorant, church. Why? Because I'm going to bring her back to me. I'm going to restore her. Just like you see Hosea restoring Gomer. So that's the theme. That's the story of This picture, the significance of the marriage and Satan desires and wants nothing more than to destroy that relationship between God and Israel and Christ and the what? Christ and the church. And if we want to get really practical, what else does he desire to do? Destroy this relationship, destroy this relationship, destroy this relationship. And believe you me, he's been pretty effective at doing that, huh? Especially in the 21st century. This is why we have to be mindful and considerate of how it is that God works and who he is in our lives. So we don't lose sight of the fact that he's got a plan. He's got a purpose for us. Plus, you have an enemy that desires nothing more than to destroy that plan and purpose. And he's real. But in the text that we're going to see here tonight in these next, um, these next chapters, um, what's really cool about the Lord, what's really cool about God is um, he is able or he does provide a refuge or rescue for his people. So let's look at chapter two real quick. <clears throat> this exposure of Gomer's sin and <laughs> the exhibition of God, or in this case, Hosea's divine love. Never forget his name. What his name means, right? It's on your little bookmark and it's all over, splattered all over your little tables there. Uh, but this guy plays a huge and significant role. Look at how it, the text or how the chapter begins here in verse number one of chapter number two. Really interesting words. And it's always... The whole family thing and bringing up the whole family thing. Now there's two new kids that show up. And this is the name of the kids. Look at this. Say ye unto your brethren. Ami. And to your sisters. Ruamah. Plead with your mother. Plead. For she is not my wife. Neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Wow. So now these two new kids show up with two new names. Say, let's call her out, man. And that's exactly what begins to happen. In This is why this point is called the exposure of the sin or the whoredoms that are playing out. You know what's so cool about the names of these two kids? The name Ami means... That is my people. And Ruma means is merciful. That God is merciful. Always reminding us of how merciful he is. Psalms 118 over and over. Every verse in the 118 Psalm says this. God's mercy what? Endures forever. God's mercy endures forever. God's mercy endures forever. God's mercy endures forever. How long is forever? forever? Forever. This is the God of the Bible. He's not some ogre up there trying to bring K 
chaos and, 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 and craziness and nonsense into your life. He's a merciful God that wants nothing more than a relationship with you and with me. That's all he desires is this intimate relationship that is revealed to us in this picture between a husband and a wife. Man, come back to me because God is merciful. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, the, the Apostle Paul writes a really cool passage about how it is that we could experience intimacy with God, right? It's in that passage in verses number 15 and 16 where he, where he talks about coming f uh, to come f uh, therefore boldly unto his throne. Remember that? In other words, you and I have access to the very throne room of God because of what Jesus did on the cross. That veil was ripped. You have access to him like nobody else. The Holy Spirit of God indwells you. He lives in that inner sanctum that is in you where he desires nothing more than to commune with you and to talk to you so that you could talk to him. That's what God desires. That's his plan. You know what he says next in that verse? He says, come boldly under the throne of grace where you can obtain, listen to this, where you can obtain mercy. You know what else you get from going to God each and every day? You obtain mercy. It's, it's, it's the mercy that we need to get through the day and then he also says and you can find grace in the time of need so in that verse he contrasts mercy and grace there's a difference between mercy and grace in scripture you know what mercy is not getting from god what we deserve as often as we wander <laughs> as often as we abandon him and leave him and how prone we are to just abandon God and not commune with him and not talk to him and ignore him and only come to him when there's a crisis in our lives. God says, all right, I'm waiting. I will still be there. That's called mercy. Bring her back. That's all God desires. The, the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. He waited and he waited each and every day for his son to return. What a powerful story that is. In our, in our discipleship, we have lessons one and two. Lesson one is the lesson on salvation. This whole relationship that was established when you got saved. Lesson number two is the lesson on eternal security, which reveals to us and reminds us that because of that relationship, you're forever his. But it doesn't, Negate the fact that we won't that we won't wander, that we won't stray. Show me in the Bible, in Luke chapter number fifteen, in the story of the prodigal, where that kid ever stopped being his son. Never. He was a disobedient son, and he reaped what he sowed, didn't he? And that's a profound truth in Scripture. God is not mocked. It says in Galatians chapter number six, verse six. God is not mocked. Um, Whatsoever a man soweth, that will he also reap. So you see that great story thing play out in Hebrews chapter number four, where you can come to God each and every day and get two things. Mercy, which is not getting from God what we really deserve. And then grace. You know what grace is? Getting from God what we don't deserve. That's grace. Another breath, another heartbeat. Each other, I see grace right there. That's grace. Relationships, the things that matter most in life. So now he's calling Israel out for their spiritual adultery. And in this thing, he says in verse number three, look at the next couple verses here. He says in verse number three, lest I strip her naked <clears throat> and set her as in the day that she was born and make her as a um, as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. There is the what? The consequence to sin. Nakedness is always likened to shame. We end up thirsty and parched when the, when the Bible says just come drink. <laughs> Then all of a sudden we find ourselves just wandering and lost, confused, dark. 
And God desires nothing more than to bring us back. Look at verse number four. The sin of the culture ultimately will impact the family as well. Look at verse number four. And I will not have mercy upon her children. For they be the children of whoredoms. Wow, those are some strong words, but. We're seeing generational sin play out even in the lives of the nation of Israel when this thing just gets passed on and passed on. So the greatest investment that we can make in the church as well as in families is continue to just teach and just love on our kids. It's really cool, man. Larry, Larry, my my wife, she's busy and doing all kinds of stuff at church, but she was sharing me, with me on the way home on Sunday. She, she had just taught the little kids she goes man that's my favorite ministry of all ministries at the church is just being with the kids because they're just so open they're just so honest and they're so genuine and um that was really cool to hear because i hear from a lot of people all the time oh that the children are our future that's nonsense that's baloney they're our present and we need to invest in them now because you know what the world knows that isn't it interesting that last night in the, in the debate, they were talking about providing child care services from the time they're three to the time they're whatever. You know why they want to do that? So they can control your kids. So the government could be mama and daddy. And I'm not saying that all the pre-K and kindergarten teachers, I'm not suggesting that they're bad necessarily, but here's what I'm, gonna, here's what I'm here to tell you. They're going to want to do and they're going to teach them whatever they want to teach them. When we as parents and as fathers and as mothers, we should be teaching them about who God is. And that has been lost within the family. And then we're going to see and we're going to reap the whole consequence of that. And all of a sudden, you're, you're growing up an entire generation. Wait till we get to chapter four next week. It's crazy. Some of the stuff that we're going to read in that, in that chapter. Now you've got an entire generation that has no concept of God. Doesn't even know who God is. We're there right now. Yeah, we are. I'm a, I'm a huge, I love to watch Jeopardy. That's one of my favorite things to do at <laughs> six o'clock in the evenings. And I'm always amazed at how smart some of the people that they pick to be on Jeopardy. What was that dude's name a few weeks ago that he won over a million bucks, a whole tower or whatever his name was. Yeah, he's my hero. He's my, that guy has like no life, man, because he must just be reading trivia stuff all day long, every day. But I really find it interesting that whenever they have notice this next anybody any Jeopardy people in the room, notice this next time whenever they whenever Alex Trebek brings up categories that are biblical, it's unbelievable how many people don't know the Bible stuff. It'll always be the last category that they pick because nobody wants it. First of all, why? Because they don't know the answers. That's where we're at as a people. I'm talking about America. I'm talking about Americans, a nation that was founded on God's word. Just like only two nations. And when we look at those timelines in all of history, only two nations have been founded on God's word. Israel and the United States of America. Very unique place. But we've lost that. So in the next several weeks, in the next couple of weeks, as we start looking at chapters four through 10, we're going to see America in terms of where it is today. And this is why we need to pray. This is why we need to be mindful. This is why we need to I think it was Marvin that said, man, wouldn't it be cool if this room, this group could move into the room next year and fill up all those chairs? Because now we have people that are learning God's word. They desire nothing more than to know him and to experience what it means to be intimate with him. This is what God desires from us. This is what happened with Gomer. She lost it. And you're going to see what she began to focus on here in a minute. Look at the rest of these verses. Look at, uh, look at uh, verse number five. This is a really interesting verse. For their mother, Gomer, right? In this text, but we know that in, in prophetically or doctrinally, it's Israel. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers. And why is she going after her lovers? This is why. That give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. You know what she? You know what she's concerned about? This stuff. It's just things. It's not about the relationship anymore. Tell me that's not us. 
Look at what we do to each other on Black Friday as a people, <laughs> right? All for stuff. I heard an interesting fact. I didn't know this, but I was watching some news and they said that 85% of every purchase on Black Friday are not gifts for other people. It's stuff for you. I want that 65-inch flat screen for 500 bucks for me. And I'll kill you for it. Is that not us or what? Isn't it sad? Isn't it pathetic? Let me show you an interesting verse in the, an interesting passage actually in the book of Colossians chapter three. Listen closely to the words <clears throat> because there's a, there's, a, um, there's a term here that's gonna show up and in this passage, you find the term defined and how, the, how, the, how God views. I'm going to tell you what the word is. It's idolatry. When we hear the term idolatry, first thing that comes to mind, now oh, that's what Israel was doing in, in 700 BC. Those 10 northern tribes, they were all idolaters. Look at all the idolaters that Paul was dealing with as he made his way through Greece and Rome and, and all these other places in, in Asia Minor. Um, you know what you know what Paul does in, in Colossians chapter number three? He defines explicit, explicitly what idolatry is. He's going to tell you what, I, what, an, what an idolater looks like spiritually. Look in chapter number three, verse, um, verse I think it's one. Yeah, it is one. Uh, Colossians chapter three, verse one. <clears throat> Look at how it begins. A condition. An if statement. If then, he, if ye then be risen with Christ, you don't have to raise up your hand, but if you're saved tonight, spiritually, you've been risen with Christ. So look what he says. If you're risen with Christ, if you know Christ is your personal savior, then this should be your approach to life. Look what he says next. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Seek what? Things. Seek the things that are spiritual, he says. Look at verse 2. Set your affection, and your affection is where your heart is. The things that matter to you. That your things that you're affectionate about. Desires and things like that. He says, set your affection on things above, and not the what? And not the things on Black Friday. If you need a TV, praise God, go get your TV, man. I got one not that long ago. But man, if you're living just to get stuff, that's exactly what happened to Solomon that caused the chaotic kingdom, right? He took his eyes off God. He began to focus just on his wealth. And in the next chapter, God says, you know what? I'm done with you, dude. I'm taking my kingdom away. Look at the rest of the verse. Set your affection on things above and not the things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid in Christ. Is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life. Shall appear. Then shall he also appear. I love this with him in glory. Just a reminder that someday. He's coming for you. That's that other event called the rapture. You will appear with him in glory. And man. God forbid or would to God. That you're punching some guy in the face on Black Friday. When you hear the trumpet sound. <laughs> right. Wouldn't that be pathetic. Wouldn't that be a sad thing that you're wrestling some guy for some TV at Walmart and the rapture hits? Gosh. Here it is, verse 5. Mortify, kill, destroy, therefore your members, your flesh, which are upon the earth. Fornication. Ooh, that's what Gomer was about. Fornicating. Adultery is fornication. Fornication, uncleanness, Inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. And covetousness, which is what? Idolatry. Which is idolatry. What's idolatry? When you're out there coveting. When you desire your neighbor's wife more than your own wife or thing, your neighbor's stuff more than your own stuff. Dang, this 55 inch is not big enough. There's a 65 inch for just 
$18 more, $20 more. Hey, I'm preaching to myself, man. <laughs> I want you to know. It's crazy, huh? He just told you and me right now. So we have a tendency to be just like northern Israel and worship idols more than the creator, right? You know, here's what, an, here's, here's, this is what idol worship is, plain and simple. Anything that you put in place of God is an idol. It could be your kids. It could be your relationships. It could be stuff. It's not just some person with some statue or burning incense for Buddha or whatever. Anything that you put in the place of God. And this is exactly where Gomer find her, finds herself in the story. And in verses 6 through 13, you find the consequence of that, that adultery, that idolatry. Look at her verse 6. The first thing that happens, this is so sad. These are the consequences of those choices that we will reap. Verse 6, Therefore, behold, I will hedge, therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall and she shall not find her paths. Wow, that's scary, isn't it? You know what happens to us? You know what will happen? We'll lose our way. We'll lose focus. We'll lose perspective. We'll follow our own path or somebody else's path. This is the consequence of that whole thing. Look at verse number seven. Her selfishness will result in indecisiveness. And she shall follow after her lovers. And she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband. For then, uh, for then was it better with me than now. <laughs> I guess I'll go back to Gomer. I mean, I guess I'll go back to Hosea. It was better. And then you know what she finds she ends up doing? She ends up leaving again. And then goes back to a Hosea and then leaves again. Reminded of a verse in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 8, where James says, a double-minded man or woman is what? Is unstable. How? In all, all his ways. Double-mindedness results in instability emotional people emotionally freaking out about everything man one day you're high one day you're low one day you're low you know that and the only solution the only answer is to go get some medications to deal with my what do they call it um what, what are they bipolar <laughs> we got all kinds of terms and all kinds of stuff for spiritual instability is what it comes down to double by it's double mindedness because we've taken our eyes off the only thing that matters, and that's Christ. Verses 8 and 9, she will lose or she loses perspective and forgets where the true blessings come from. Look at verses 8 and 9 here. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Wow. Wow. The very gifts of God are being offered up to the to the God to the gods of the Assyrians. Verse number nine. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and will cover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. Right, I end up losing everything ultimately. Right. That said, verse number eight is the really sad part of this passage. And this is something that we're all susceptible of if we're not careful. And that is the issue of having an ungrateful heart. That's where apostasy or falling away begins. If you don't believe me, go read Romans chapter one, verses 20 to 24, 25. Probably the greatest chapter on the human condition and what goes on in a, a person's heart 
when they fall away from God. And the very first thing that Paul says comes comes to play or plays out in their lives or in our lives is we're unthankful. The day that we stop being grateful is the day that we start to lose perspective. And this is exactly what happened with Gomer in this story here. Verses 10 and 11. And all of a sudden, she's worshiping these false idols, these false religions, and the religion just becomes vain, man. Because we're ungrateful and we lose sight of who God is and his purpose for our lives. I'm still a Jew. I'm still from the nation of Israel, so it's my duty to go to church. I still go to church because it's the thing to do. It's Sunday morning, for gosh sakes. And their faith becomes vain. Look at verses 10 and 11. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease her feast days and her new moons and her Sabbaths and all her solemn feasts. I see it every Sunday morning living where I live. Larry and I always, I always make a snide comment to Larry. Coming down Bishop's Lodge Road and I'm heading towards or past Fort Marcy just before I get to the Scottish Rite Sunday mornings at 8, 8.30 in the morning. Guess what I see every Sunday morning in that area? Anybody have any clue? People walking their dogs? Actually, I, I got a text the other day. I invited somebody to church and she had the no, it's okay. She, I, say, I was going to say she had the audacity to reply. She says to me, no, the mountain is my church. I'm going skiing. And they're just lined up, man. No concept of God. No thought of God. I'm just going to have a good time because I'm living the dream. I'm not saying that you shouldn't go skiing for God's sakes. Don't. I'm not going anywhere with that. All of a sudden, your priorities are radically changed. And God doesn't matter. And man, Sunday, Sundays used to be a sacred time for this country, for this nation, for the believer. And God says, I'm taking this away. Yeah, Michelle? Flax is like wool and the linens that are provided from the flock, whether it be sheep or goats, that's flax. And the corn, the term corn doesn't mean corn necessarily, like we would eat corn on the cob, but corn means uh, sustenance from the field. It could be wheat. It could be anything from a field. That's corn biblically in that context. In other words, you're very close. You're very, you're, whatever it is that you are experiencing in this life, God, you know, and, and I don't have to tell you, see a family destroyed, right? And all of a sudden you see two people fighting for stuff. It's crazy. And things become more important than the relationship and everything else. It's just, that's an indication of where people are at spiritually. See it in the life of of Gomer in this story. All right. We're, to, we're 12, 12 and 13. I don't think I touched these verses, did I? Oh, uh, look what happens next. The issue becomes worshiping the God of the Assyrians who is Baal or Baal. Look at verse 12. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees whereof she has said there are my rewards that my lovers have given me and I will make them a forest and the beasts of the field shall eat them. In other words, she becomes completely, I don't know, what's the word? Um, Sold out. Sold out. has nothing. Right. Verse 13. And I will visit upon the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and she forgot me, saith the Lord. The consequence of abandoning her one true love. And in verse 14, <laughs> oh, I laugh because God is just so merciful. Right here, he begins with this whole restoration part of the, 
story. And now you're seeing an exhibition of God's divine love in the rest of this chapter. Look at verse one. Therefore, behold, I love this. Therefore, behold, God says, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Isn't that cool? Loves unconditionally. Think about the prophetic implications of this verse, though. Do you guys remember some of these, some of the words that are showing up in the text? Leroy, what comes to mind? I see you taking off your glasses and pondering and thinking and assessing. What comes to mind? This is book of Revelation stuff. Do you remember this? Remember in Revelation chapter 12? Just as the Antichrist and the dragon shows up and the false prophet in that chapter. And what does God do? He takes Israel into where? The wilderness. To protect her. To take care of her. The woman. That's the woman in Revelation chapter 12. The wayward woman who is a picture. Good, good point, Arlene. The picture that Gomer is in the story. God unconditional, unconditionally allures her to remove her from all this crap and all the consequence of her sin that we just read about here from verse number 6 to number 13. If you guys remember from our study in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, that place in the wilderness that God is going to take her Look at verse number 15. And I will give her a vineyards and thence in the valley of Achor for the door of hope. And she shall sing there in the days of her youth and in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Just a really powerful and a very significant picture of how God is going to handle and take care of the nation of Israel during the, the tribulation period. If you remember one of those places that the Bible speaks about, and as a matter of fact, um, Look with me and, and turn there real quick to Micah chapter 2, verse 12. I want you to see this. This is a tribulation period prophetic passage. This is one of the, one of the minor prophets that we'll be looking at down the road. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. So it's the sixth one from Hosea. If you're not sure where that is, count six books down from Hosea. In Micah chapter 2, verse 2, you find these, in verse 12, you find these words. Micah 2, 12. I will surely assemble, O Israel. Did you catch that? I'm sorry, O Jacob. He's going to allure her. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, right? Where's where he going to where's he going to gather them where he's going to where's he going to take them look at the next part of it goes I will put them together as the sheep of Bozra Bozra as the flock in the midst of their fold they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men Do you guys remember this part of our study Where's Bozra it's a literal place. It's a physical place on a map on the, on this planet. Not Basra. Bozra. Another name for Petra is Bozra. Here it is on a modern day map. Here's modern day Israel. Here's Elat. Here's where we're going to be going in a couple of weeks to this little place along the Red Sea. But there's Petra right here. Petra is also known as Bozra. Here's what it looks like today. These are some pictures of Petra in Jordan, in Edom. Physically, literally looks like this. You know where God's going to take them into the wilderness. And he's going to protect them. Here's what's really crazy. You know what the word Bozra means? Come on, you, I know you guys know. Remember this from our study back? A few, say it again, Steve. Flock of sheep. 
You're getting hold. Did I hear you say it? Fold. Say it loud. Fold. fold what? It's a sheepfold. Bozrah means sheepfold. That's it. Absolutely it did. Yeah. You're very observant, Jack. See that looking cave? See that cave thing is really cool with Jim Martin when you're hanging out with Jim Martin. I don't know who these two over here on the left are, but I know that lady over here on the very far left. <laughs> There's Froggy and Ollie and I don't know those other two. But it's really cool with Jim Martin. Actually, where Froggy is looking right now is towards the sheepfold where I'm sitting. That look cave looking thing. That is called a sheepfold. You know what the whole purpose for the sheepfold is? To protect the sheep. To protect the sheep. Yeah. You put the sheep in there. So when Jesus says, I am the door, I'm standing right at the door of the sheepfold. He's our shepherd. And he's saying to the, to the disciples in the gospel of John chapter 12, the thief comes to what? To steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to, come to give you life and a life more abundantly. And in that same passage, he refers to himself as the door of the sheepfold. In other words, that thief ain't going to come through me. And you know who his sheep are? Spiritually, it's you guys. Because his sheep hear my voice. But you know who his sheep are doctrinally? The nation of Israel. So he's going to take them to Bozrah and he's going to hide them from the Antichrist and his armies. And in Revelation chapter 12, you could see that whole passage play out. Because those are his sheep. And what's really cool is when I first got there, I remember the first trip that I took to Israel, we pulled in right to the same exact spot. And in the distance where you can see Bobby Lee and Tish is this, is this shepherd's field. And Jim Martin is able to time it just right. And he knows exactly when to be there. And uh, he sits us down. He won't tell you that you're sitting in front of a sheepfold. You're just kind of sitting there. And he begins to teach. He'll take you to John chapter 12. And all of a sudden, you, in the distance, you could hear the shepherd calling his sheep. And you know what's really cool about the shepherd? They know his voice. And they follow him. And they do exactly what he's commanding them to do. And that's what you're seeing over here in this bottom picture is a picture of that shepherd bringing a sheep down. And at some point at the end of the day, as after they're finished feeding, after they're finished grazing, they're going to make their way to the sheepfold. And that's where he protects them. We didn't know that was a sheepfold. I pulled up and I said, wow, there's a cool cave right here. Oh, is that you? It was me. <laughs> that is... The sheepfold and this is Bozra, man. And this is exactly what God is going to do. So he says to you and he says to me and he goes, you know what? I'm going to bring her. Look at verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortabler, comfortably. He's just in that one verse gave you a prophetic truth about how God is going to handle Israel in the tribulation period. So now he's ex ex exhibiting this incredible divine love. And in verse 15, look what happens next. And I will give her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came out of the land of Egypt. Book of Joshua stuff. And it shall be in that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, I love that word, that phrase. You know what it means? My husband. How did you know, Sylvia? Oh, you said it. It, mean, it means my husband. My husband. Look at this. Now I will call his my name Ishi. Um, As in the days of her youth and the days when she came out of the land of Egypt and she shall be in that day, saith the Lord, that they shall call me Ishi and shall call me no more Baal. Baal. No more worshiping him. Now I've been restored to my husband. What do you think these verses, verses 15, 16, and 17 are a picture of? Read them again. Specifically, what dispensation? Come on, Leroy. Look at this. 
Rapture? Who said rapture? No? Come on. When are things going to bloom again? When are things going to be restored again? The millennium. Everything's back. The king is on the throne. And now she knows. She knows Israel will finally know who Jesus is. The return of the king. That's my husband, and that's what she'll call him. I found this really cool article that speaks of God's endless and unconditional love for his people. I'm not going to read the rest of these verses in verse number, number verses. Let's keep reading, and then I'll read a cool, this, this really cool write-up by a guy by the name of uh, Donald Barnhouse, who was an old preacher back in the, in the 40s and 50s. But look with me here in verses uh, uh, 18 through 23. And in that day, there's the second coming, right? In that day, will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely, right? Does that ring a bell? The lion and the lamb laying together. When does that happen? In the, no, not the tribulation. See, are you, getting, are you getting these pictures? Aren't these pictures powerful? There ain't nothing safe going on in the tribulation period, I guarantee it. Look at verse number 19, and I will betroth her. In other words, I will, I will engage with her. And I will betroth these unto me forever, and I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will hear, saith the Lord, and I will, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth and the earth shall bear the corn and the wine and the oil and they shall hear Jezreel and I will sow her unto me in the earth and I will have mercy upon her that hath not obtained mercy, that hath not obtained mercy. And I will say to them, which were not my people, thou art my people. And they shall say, thou art my God. Isn't that cool? Restoration. You know what's so cool about the end of this passage, the last verse in chapter two? It's a contrast to what Jezreel means and to what the other two kids' names meant. Right? You know what that means? It's redemption. It's called restoration. God restores his bride back to him because of his endless unconditional love for them. Listen to these words by Donald Gray Barnhouse. Who can explain the insanity of true love? For love is of God and it is infinite. Love is sovereign. Love is apart from reason. Love exists for its own reasons. Love is not according to logic. Love is is according to love. Thus it was for Hosea, for he was playing the part that God has played with you all of your life and with me. The pursuing love of God is the greatest wonder of the spiritual universe. Isn't it awesome? This dude pursued her, man. He allured her. Never stopped loving her. We leave God in the heat of our own self-desire and run from his will because we want so much to have our own way. We get to a crossroads and look back in pride, thinking that we have outdistanced him, just as we are about to congratulate ourselves on our achievement of self-enthronement. And then we feel a touch of our own arm and turn in that direction to find him there. My child, he says in great tenderness, I love you. And when I saw you running away from all that is good, I pursued you through a shortcut that love knows well and awaited you here at the crossroads. We have torn ourselves free from his grasp and rushed off again through deepest woods and farthest swamp. And we look back again and we are sure this time that we have succeeded in escaping from him. But once more, <laughs> just like Gomer, but once more, the touch of love is on our other sleeve. And when we turn quickly, we find that he is there pleading with the eyes of love and showing himself once more to the tender and faithful one to be the tender and faithful one, loving to the end. He will always say, my child, my name and nature are love. 
and I must act according to that which I am. So it is that I have pursued you to tell you that when you are tired of your running and your wandering, I will be there to draw you to myself once more. When you see the love at work through the heart of Hosea, I'm sorry, when you see this love at work through the heart of Hosea, we may wonder if God is really like that. But everything in his word or in the word and in experience shows us that he is. He will give man the trees of the forest. Listen to these words. These are so incredible. He will, he will give man the trees of the forest and the iron in the ground. Then he will give to man the brains to make an axe from the iron to cut down a tree and fashion it into a cross. He will give man the ability to make a hammer and nails. And when man has, has the cross and the hammer and the nails, the Lord will allow that man to take hold of him and bring him to that cross. He will stretch out his hands upon it and allow man to nail him to that cross. And in so doing, he will take the sins of man upon himself and make it possible for those who have despised and rejected him to come to him and know the joy of sins removed and forgiven, to know the assurance of pardon and eternal life, and to enter into the prospect of the hope and glory with him forever. This is even our God, and there is none like him. Isn't that awesome? That's what Hosea pictures in this story. God's endless, unconditional love for Gomer. And then in chapter 3, we're going to see the repentance. <coughs> and restoration of a people. That's what you find in this chapter. This chapter, only five verses. Real quick, verses 1 two through 3. Just by way of just kind of an overview. I'm not going to be able to spend a whole lot of time with these. You're going to find Romans 9 revealed to us in the first three verses. Remember what? We were talking about earlier, there's three chapters in the New Testament that speak specifically to the church about Israel. Romans chapters 9, 10, 11, they're parenthetical. They're there for a reason because God never wants us to lose sight of the fact that God is not done with Israel, that he's going to restore her as a people, as a nation. They're part of God's eternal plan and purpose. So in chapter 9, what you find is Paul writing about their past. That God loves Israel. I was of the tribe of Benjamin, he says. This is what I'm about. I'm, I wish, I, he's even, he even goes as far as saying, man, I wished, and if I could, I would die for them. But they need to know and they need to understand as a people that Jesus Christ already died for them. That's what chapter nine is about. And then in chapter number 10 of Romans, Paul starts to write about them in the present tense. This is where we find those very profound words about salvation where Paul says to them, man, you need to come to Christ, Jewish people. And that's why he says, all you have to do is this, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be what? Saved. Thou shalt shall be saved. And then two verses later in verse number 14, you know what he says next? That there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. That salvation is for everyone. So the goal and the hope and the prayer as we look at that timeline is to witness to Jewish people, witness to our Jewish friends so that they could accept Jesus Christ as Savior. You know what? From God's perspective, they're no longer part of the nation of Israel. Now they're part of the church. Now they're, quote, believers just like the early church was all Jews. We're seeing people in Israel today coming to Christ. Does anybody have a prayer list from Sunday? with them ollie do you have yours no anybody have a prayer list from the little prayer points can you grab one real quick larry i want to show you the fourth prayer point something to consider something to be mindful of something to be aware that because this is a reality for us even now do you have it with you david <clears throat> david provides these to the church oh do you have it yeah this, that's it thank you sylvia this is the last prayer point we, we publish four prayer points every Sunday morning because there's a group of us that gathers before church on Sunday mornings just to pray. 
And we're praying for some of you guys for discipleship, for all kinds of things. And uh, Sylvia, it's, Sylvia found it on her phone. There. Um, so this is the fourth point. Listen to this. And I think, David, uh, did you send this to, you sent this to Larry Sosha? Okay. Okay. This is what, this is what it says. Pray for Pastor Dimitri and his wife, Ella, and the ministry in Beersheba. Do you guys remember Beersheba when we were there? Yeah. In the ministry in Beersheba, Israel, neighbors are trying to force them out of a facility on their own property where they provide food and clothing for the poorest of Eastern European Jews who have fled to Israel for safety. Claiming that Pastor Dimitri is breaking the law by teaching that Jesus is the Messiah. Persecution of Christians around the world is steadily increasing and pressure is mounting. But specifically, this prayer was a prayer request from Dimitri to us saying, pray for us because of what's going on. You know who's persecuting them? Anybody have any idea? The fellow Jewish neighbors. Their fellow Jewish neighbors. That's the reality of this whole thing. I'm not talking about Muslims or some other group out there. These are Jews persecuting Jews that have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Because they don't want to see those Eastern European Jews come to Christ. Tell me that the enemy isn't real and will do anything. That's recent. This is a prayer request from last week. And then in chapter number 11, chapter 4, verse 4, Romans 10 speaks of the present. And chapter 5, verse 5 of chapter uh, number 3 speaks of Israel's future. They are and they will be restored. That is a fact. It's happening right before our eyes. And the sooner the church realizes it, the better. That way we won't get caught up in all the crazy geopolitics that you're seeing playing out even within our, even within our own government and what's happening um, in this year, which is also an election year. That God has a plan and he has a purpose for Israel. And if I were you, I'd be very sensitive and be very mindful and very, very aware about what these people believe about the nation of Israel. Study their foreign policy. Get on their websites. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. By, by the way, God's going to decide who's going to make it in. We know that from Daniel chapter 2, verse 25, right? God's already determined who's going to get in next week. That said, however, never forget Genesis 12, verse 3. When God says, I'm going to bless those that bless thee, I'm going to curse them that curse at thee. And I don't know what you guys think about this Bernie guy, man, but he's a nutcracker to the nth degree. <laughs> and he is a professing Jew. But he, is, but he has surrounded himself with more anti-Semites than I've ever seen in the world. Just a heads up, man. But you guys need to check and assess all these guys out. So, God restores them. Let's read those five verses and we'll be closed. In Hosea chapter number three, then said the Lord unto me, go yet love a woman, beloved her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I brought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and for a homer of barley. And I said unto her, thou shall abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee, for the children of Israel. See how he's tying this up? He's letting us know who he's been talking about this whole time. And for the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without a teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and fear the Lord and his goodness in the what? In the latter days. In the days that we're living right now. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for tonight, for this amazing book that sheds so much light about your plan and 
your purpose, but Lord, more importantly, about your nature. Lord, about your unforgiving, endless, unconditional love for your people. Lord, for the people of Israel, but Lord, also for us. Thank you for loving us, Lord Jesus, like you do. And I pray, Lord, that we would never, ever lose sight of that love and that plan and that purpose that you have for each and every one of us, Lord, as we step out and embrace, Lord, your plan and your purpose for our lives so that you could be glorified, so that this world, so a lost and dying world could experience that endless, unconditional love that you showed us, Lord Jesus, when you died for each and every one of us on that cross. Be with us now, Lord. Again, I thank you for this picture, for this example in your word of Hosea and Gomer and all that it represents, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.